Hello, St. James. It's good to be with you. I hope this finds you doing well on this, the fourth Sunday of Epiphany. Uh, our readings for today are actually for uh, an occasion celebrated on Tuesday, Candle Mass, or the presentation of our Lord. Um, just a few announcements before we begin. One, thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, uh, St. James has risen to the occasion when asked to uh, to give generously. The school and the church combined uh, have um, have provided a tremendous amount of food for us to be able to put together into snow packs for those who uh, really count on the public school system here in Fauquier County for a, a substantial meal, their primary meal of the day often. Uh, and uh, the snow packs will allow us uh, and the school system to be able to provide those meals uh, when they're not in school. So thank you very, very much. Um, also, we have a new staff person, uh, Anna Maria Ward, will come on board this week as our new communication director. So, um, so be on the lookout for her work uh, in the days to come. Um, also, I hope you have had a chance to uh, read the weekly email. Uh, please, please definitely take uh, the time to make sure you're receiving it and to let uh, Nancy know if you're not receiving it because this coming Sunday is our annual meeting and uh, in the weekly will be the link to the Zoom meeting, uh, the, biogra the, the biographies of the four candidates. I hope you take time to read those. They, they really were, were, were moving um, and uh, uh, to acknowledge those that are rolling off the vestry. Uh, but that Zoom link uh, so that you can join us next Sunday, next Sunday, February 7th, uh, at 1015 is in the weekly email. So please uh, make sure to check the weekly email out this week uh, so that you get that, okay? Thank you very, very much. Also, uh, in the life of the church, we uh, encourage you to get your uh, vaccine as soon as you are eligible. I know uh, there's a, a limited supply, but please get on the waiting list. Uh, the sooner we uh, are vaccinated, especially uh, those most vulnerable in our community, the sooner uh, we can return to some of the things that we miss so dearly, like gathering together uh, for church. Uh, so I encourage you to do so. There is information in the weekly about how to make sure that you are uh, in the queue. So, so please do that. And with that, we begin our worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We miss being with you at St. James. And we hope to see everyone again soon. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we humbly pray that as your only begotten Son was this day presented in the temple, so we may be presented to you with pure and clean hearts by Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Prayers of the People I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, our bishops, Ben and Ted, our clergy. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially for Joseph, our president, the Congress, and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in law enforcement, for their safety, their morale, and that they may know the support and gratitude of the communities they serve. We pray for those in the armed forces, their families, and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. I ask your prayers for all those who have suffered or feared discrimination, mistreatment, or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand to acknowledge our corporate responsibility and guide us towards sustained healing, reconciliation, and unity. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison, especially during this season. Pray for those in any need or trouble especially for Richard, Becky, Ellsworth, Paula, Ruby, Tom, Pat, Patty, Ansel, Tina, Kay, Marie, 
and for those whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for all healthcare and emergency workers, those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services, and those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church and School, our Stephen ministers, and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died and any whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for the peace and unity of the Church of God for the faithful and growing relationship between First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we now name either silently or aloud. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. From wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, may we know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together. Embolden us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope, your healing, and your love. We pray this in the name of your Son, who came and dwelt among us, Jesus our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, the parents of Jesus brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn, firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, you are now dissimming your servant in peace, according to, to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and, and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter, daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. Then, as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So it's hard to believe, in fact, it, it sort of threw me to think that exactly one year ago, Anna was in Ecuador and I was frantically awaiting Larley's passport to arrive from DC uh, so that we could join her and then go to the Galapagos for uh, an unforgettable 
experience of a lifetime. And one of the things I was most excited about uh, was seeing those giant tortoise. Uh, they uh, can get up to 900 pounds and they live up to 170 years and they grow uh, their whole lifespan. Uh, and uh, it truly was amazing. But it, you know, I have to say that was one of the few disappointments uh, in, in an absolutely uh, just incredible uh, experience. All the other animals you see in their natural habitat, uh, totally unfettered by, by human presence, uh, but because they had been uh, hunted almost to extinction, extinction by explorers and others uh, who came for their shells and for the meat, uh, these uh, tortoises uh, lived almost exclusively uh, on, uh, uh, on san in sanctuaries or, or places set aside for them. Uh, and uh, the younger ones uh, were, were sort of in, um in little uh, enclosures, uh, you know, for the 10 year olds and under and the 20 year olds and 30 year olds and 40 year olds. And, and they age a little bit like baby Yoda, if you've been following, uh, you know, the, the 40 year olds uh, still look like infants compared to the, uh, the giants. Um, uh, and, uh, and I thought of the folks that uh, have dedicated their lives to this project. Uh, uh, so many people, uh, you read all of the, the panels and you listen to the, uh, the folks uh, who walk you around and you realize what an undertaking it is uh, to be able to, to not just protect, but to, uh, to repopulate the species. And the thing that struck me was that the vast majority of the people uh, that have uh, any involvement in this will never even see even part of a generation reach maturity. I mean, if you spent 50 years doing this, which is a long time to spend at any vocation. If you spent 50 years, it wouldn't be a third of one lifetime for these tortoises. Uh, and it also made me think that if you were to do that, it would have to be for something beyond the immediate gains, something beyond realizing the immediate impact. It's something that is so longitudinal, sometimes it's hard to even get your mind around. But you have to have a vision or a dream or a mission that is larger than yourself to participate in something like that. It made me think of my cousin, who I've talked about, uh, who, who died this year. And, um, and I remember when he first started his foundation, uh, the Travis Roy Foundation, to, uh, um, to help uh, with spinal cord research and also help provide grants uh, for those who had been uh, injured uh, and didn't have the, the NCAA's insurance and all the things that Trav did have that allowed for him to get all of the accommodations to give him the highest quality of life that one could have. And I feel like for the first 10, maybe the first 15 years uh, of his work with the foundation, uh, there was a sense that maybe, maybe if, uh, if the research went in the right direction, they could restore Travis's capacity to walk. And I think that was the dream. But eventually, I think it occurred to him that those uh, connections um, uh, had not uh, been there for so long uh, and that that it really wasn't for him anymore. That the work that he did were for for other members of humanity uh, that might go through the same experience that he went through. But uh, but I think for the last half of uh, his his work, it was entirely for uh, for those that uh, that would come after him. That they wouldn't have to go through what he went through. And and again, I think it's being part of something larger than yourselves. And I. Uh, I had to think about that this week as I, um, uh, as I got my vaccination. And I thought about all those people, especially those uh, that got so close to the finish line. Uh, you know, you still read every time you, you open up the paper uh, of the hospitalization raid or uh, the, the, the deaths, even in, uh, even in our county, uh, and, 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 and the deaths that have touched us. Uh, and you think, if only a few more months... Uh, and you think of all those frontline workers, all the people that have, uh, that have worked to, to make people well, that have saved people's lives, uh, some who have lost their own in the process, uh, the people that have uh, worked for a vaccine. And you think of how many people in this process have had to step outside themselves, have had to buy into something so much more profound than their own lives. I think that's what we're all called to do, to 
be able to have a dream that is so close to God's dream that ourselves, our own self, gets out of the way. I thought about that as uh, I reflected on the presentation of Jesus. And we picked this reading uh, because we were discussing it uh, during our adult formation class and we uh, determined uh, that this is such an important reading, but it doesn't really get the attention it deserves. By the time we get to the other side of, of Christmas Day, uh, the crowds have thinned out. And usually uh, for that first Sunday of Christmas, uh, uh, we read from that, uh, that passage of John. And so uh, the witness of Simeon and Anna often never get the attention they deserve. Uh, but I thought of them as I think about those people who had dreams bigger than their own lives. Uh, bigger than the, the time that they will be on this on this earth. Uh, but let me go through the story a little bit. So uh, Jesus is 40 days old. Uh, it's an important uh, time because at 40 days, that's when uh, he would be presented in the temple. Uh, it's when the, he was old enough that they trusted that, um, that he would be healthy. Uh, it also is when his mother uh, had uh, been through the necessary period of time for her to, to go through a purification rite to be able to, to return to temple life. Uh, and so all of this happens. And the presentation uh, is when uh, a child is presented as part of the Jewish faith. And the first thing we learn as they go to the temple, the first thing that we learn is that Jesus' parents are poor. We may have already known from the rest of the story, but the offering that they're able to offer in the temple is not a rich man's offering. It's, it's not a lamb. It's two turtle doves. That's the poor person's offering. Stop and think about that for a while. The king of kings, the savior of the world, the child of God, the son of man is presented in the, te in the temple, presented to his tradition, marked as a poor person, marked as less than. Jesus has an incredibly complicated relationship with the temple that runs his whole life. Uh, it is a place where he feels uh, he can commune with God. It's the place that uh, he gets lost for days. His parents have already headed out of Jerusalem. They're a day down the road. They come back and they look for three days for him. And he's in the temple so mesmerized, uh, so absorbed uh, by all of the storytelling and the wisdom and the presence of God that he doesn't even know he's been lost. For days he's been lost and he doesn't know. So he definitely appreciates what is in the temple. What he struggles with is the fact that all of that is, is available for everyone all the time. It's not held within those walls. And those walls certain, certainly shouldn't keep people out, especially those who suffer from financial and other realities that weigh down on them. Those are the people for whom God has a special place. So when the temple is a place that identifies the poor from the rich, a place where you have to uh, work through the money changers uh, and, and, and lose a good bit of money in the exchange so that you can come in and commune with God who made you, who loves you, who wants desperately to commune with you, that's where Jesus struggles, and it starts even before Jesus is able to vocalize a word as he's presented in the temple. But as this is going on, uh, in the very next line, Simeon, uh, so overcome by the Holy Spirit and the promise that the Holy Spirit has given him that uh, in his lifetime, he will see what people have waited generations to know. People have been born lived full, rich lives and gone to their grave with the hope that has not been really realized but has not been extinguished. The hope that God is at the helm, uh, that God is invested, that God will send a savior, a light into the world. And Simeon, just glowing, just radiating, comes almost bounding into the temple as much as a man of his age can bound. And he takes that child and he holds him so tenderly in his arms and he looks 
at that child and he sees all that light, all that promise, all of the hopes of so many generations, that dream that is outside of himself. And he realizes that he can go and lay his head down and God can take him because he has seen the fulfillment of his people's dreams, their yearnings. He has seen that God is in fact in the world. That God cares and that God is in control. You know, in the few days he has left, whether he'll realize uh, Jesus' first miracle at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, whether he'll hear stories about the feeding of the 5,000, uh, whether he'll be there when uh, Jesus is nailed to a cross, none of these things will happen. They'll happen well after he is long since gone. But he has hope. The dream that transcends his life is being realized. And it's enough. It's more than enough. And he tells Mary, not just that this is the one, that this is a light to enlighten all nations, that this will bring uh, folks from the Jewish tradition, the Gentile tradition. This is the, the galvanizing force in the universe, but also this child will break her heart. A sword will enter her that it will not come without suffering. It's a moment that takes us immediately from Christmas to Easter. But you can see in the hope of that man holding that child that it certainly doesn't end on the cross. You can see Easter in that moment. And then Anna. Anna, who has been a widow for longer than uh, she can care to remember, probably hardly even remembers those short seven years with her husband so long ago. She has been a widow for lifetimes two-thirds of her life, if not more. Not only has she been a widow, but she's been someone who is a ward of the church. You know, if you're a widow that young, um, you don't have children, you don't have family that's willing to take you under their wing, you depend on the church. And so that's where she lives. She comes in every day, or doesn't really even leave, just kind of lives in the church. She's been waiting. She's been experiencing all of those hopes of people that have come uh, day in and day out into the temple. And she also has realized this is the one. Our hopes are being realized. She's still a widow. She's still dependent on the temple. The touch of that young infant child doesn't make her young again. It doesn't bring her a husband. It doesn't bring her financial security. But it gives her hope. Hope not just for her own life, not really for her own life, but for her people. I think it's time for us to grab hold of that. That Jesus isn't about just what we get from our relationship with Jesus. Our work in this life is not just about the measurable returns that we can see or, uh, uh, or the attaboys we get or the satisfaction we get, but it's about participating in something beyond ourselves, of having a vision or a dream that may last generations, that certainly will outlive us when we participate in God's dream, when we believe deep down that God is at the helm, that God's investment in our lives is true and real and guiding, and it is light. It changes how we live. It changes our level of impatience. It invites us beyond ourselves. It invites us beyond this not so easy moment we find ourselves because we're bound to one another. We're bound to one another's stories and we're bound to one another's hopes. 
and those hopes and those dreams that are God's hopes and dreams will go on well beyond us. Amen. Remember that life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who traveled the way with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love, and the blessing of God Almighty in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Our worship is now ended and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ, alleluia. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.